Let's talk about Skyrise, the only bidding game you need to have in your collection. Welcome to Brains on Games. I'm Dr. Brian McDonald. In this episode, we're going to talk about Skyrise by Roxley Games. This is a brand new game by the company that actually published the number one game on Board Game Geek, the top rated game, Brass Birmingham, is by Roxley Games. That game had an 8.6 rating. This one has an 8.1. This is a fantastic bidding game from Roxley Games. The game is called, I don't even know if you'll be able to see it on the camera, the game is called Skyrise. Now this is the premium collector's edition. It just delivered on Kickstarter recently, so it should be hitting retail soon, but you may not be able to find the fancy version that I'm going to be showing you today. Skyrise is a game for between two and four players. It says age 14 and up, and that's true for understanding the strategy, but the rules are simple. Uh, and this is a game that you can play in anywhere from, well, it would be unusual to have a 30-minute game, but it does say in the box 30 minutes to an hour and 15 minutes. Let's take a deeper look at Skyrise by Roxley Games. This game is gorgeous, and I've set up the camera so that you can see the board because you've got these buildings that you're going to be putting on here. You're building a floating city is what you're trying to do. And, and you can see that there's a 3D board that's 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 placed on a board that's really only here as a victory point tracker and to show some clouds underneath the city that you're building. This is a medium weight game and like I said the rules are simple. It won't take me long to explain how to play this one uh, and it's a game where what you're trying to do is earn the most prestige, the most victory points after two eras of play. This is a bidding game, not an auction game, it's a bidding game and it's open bid so everybody can see what everyone else is bidding and like I said you're trying to earn the most points. Uh, like most Roxley games, well many of the Roxley games that I've played recently uh, including Brass, including uh, Steampunk Rally Fusion, they've got these historical figures that are in the game. We're talking about, well, visionaries, I think they call them in the rule book. We're talking about architects and artists and filmmakers in the case of Fritz Lang. There's, there's no asymmetric abilities. These, all of the player boards are the same other than just the picture uh, of the, the visionary and the color of the board. They are double-sided if you want to play a different visionary. And because I picked Fritz Lang as the player board that I showed you, uh, we'll be mostly placing blue buildings on the board today. But what each player is going to have is a set of buildings. They're in three different sizes. You've got short, medium, and tall. And then you're going to have a, a special building that's a wonder. And, and the wonder is kind of like, a, a, well, it's a building that trumps <laughs> any any other bids. So this is the, the building that will guarantee that you're going to win that particular round of play. The players don't have asymmetric abilities, but the different colored buildings do have different numbers on the bottom. Roxley was very clever in how they put this together. So you're going to have, well, maybe one player has a few higher numbers of the medium-sized building. You know, there might be a player that has one really high number on the tall building. So you're going to have different numbers. Some of them have dots underneath the dots underneath the number just mean that that's a building that you don't get to use until the second era, the second round of play. And what you're doing here is bidding on neighborhoods. You're trying to construct your buildings in different neighborhoods. And you do that by placing those buildings face up on the board so everyone can see the number. Now if I bid that 23, the next player has a choice. They can either pass and then they're out of that round of bidding. They can't come back in on a later round and bid again or they can place a higher number building adjacent to the one that was most recently bid. So you might place a number 51 right over here. Now, if the third player, if the yellow player say has passed and they don't want to use a higher building, they wanna save it for later, then it can come back around to the first player who bid and then they can place a higher number if they want to on another adjacent property in an adjacent neighborhood to the most recent bid and it goes back and forth until all but one player has decided to pass. Once all of those players have passed, all but one, then one of these buildings is going to get constructed. It gets flipped right side up so that you can no longer see the number because the number doesn't matter. The other buildings go back to the players who placed them and then you're going to get one of these little chips from the board. Now this letter C is a special one that I'll tell you about. 
but those chips fit into those dual layer player boards and this is one of the ways that you're going to earn prestige points, victory points at the end of the game. So I, I, I won't talk yet about the, the letters, but you've got these different color uh, chips that are going to fit in here that will increase the number of victory points that your buildings are worth at the end of the game. Again, another clever wrinkle here is that if you place three of these chips, each building at the end of the game, each building that you've placed on a yellow neighborhood, and you can see there's different color neighborhoods on the board, each building on a yellow neighborhood is going to be worth six points. But if you get four of these yellow chips, that value drops down to four points instead. Now if you do get those four and then you manage to grab another yellow chip on the board, that yellow chip is worth 10 points. It's going to go over here on this side of the board because it can no longer fit once you've got your four yellow chips. So it's going to go over here and that's going to count for 10 points at the end of the game. So it drops down the value of each building but you have a chance to earn a large number of points just by taking one neighborhood. Now the other wrinkle that makes this game more complicated in terms of planning out your strategy is that you can see on the board that the chips don't necessarily match the neighborhoods that they're on. So over here we've got a brown chip on a white neighborhood. Uh, you've got, you, sometimes you might be lucky enough to get a white chip on a white neighborhood. Here's a green one on a brown neighborhood. So they, those chips are assigned randomly at the start of the game. Before anybody's taken their player boards, you're going to draw those chips out of this bag and the rule book even has instructions for how to make sure that you've randomized those. So you're grabbing the chips by winning a bid on a particular neighborhood, that's going to earn you victory points at the end of the game, but they might be victory points that are based on buildings that are placed in a different color neighborhood. So it does get quite complicated to juggle what it is that you're trying to do. Now you do have those letter chips as well, and you may be able to see that there's four uh, pictures here at the top of the board. These patrons will will give you victory points for each of those chips that you've earned, but you don't know at the start of the game which is going to be worth the most. They might be worth uh, three or four or five or eight points. And I've just flipped over the letter A and that one's worth eight. So if I win a bid on a neighborhood that has one of these letters, I get to peek at what the value is. I don't have to tell anyone else, but I can lie to them <laughs> about what's on there. Uh, and then I might decide, ooh, I want to earn more of those, or ooh, I don't care to earn too many of those letter C's, which in this case is only worth four points each time I place one. Arrow 1 ends when one player has placed all of their buildings. Once they've won enough bids that all of their buildings, their round 1, arrow 1 buildings, are right side up and placed on the board. And then you do get to count up some points. Those points are based on which islands you control. You're also going to get a few victory points or you have a chance to earn a few victory points from these cards. These panorama cards are placed beside the board at the start of the game and they're worth two or three points depending on what you control. So if you control the neighborhoods on either side of a bridge, for example, you're going to score three points for that. If you've got three buildings around a lake, you might score. So th there's a small deck of these panorama cards and two of them are chosen at the start of the game. So there's two ways where you can earn some extra victory points and you earn them at the end of era one, you get to earn them again at the end of era two. Then you pair down so that you've only got one of these wonder cards and then everybody gets to see what your wonder ability is going to be and you begin the next round and you do your bidding the same way but now you've got your era two buildings and maybe you have a few leftover buildings from era one if you weren't the first player to get rid of all of those the first player to finally construct all of their buildings in era two is going to get the key to the city check out this thing so the key to the city gives you 10 victory points the second player, if you're in a three-player game or a four-player game, the second player to construct all of their buildings gets this coin, which is worth four victory points. So there's a few points for getting your buildings on the table, but the game doesn't end until everyone's constructed everything. So there's going to be one player who may, maybe has one or two buildings left, and then they get to put them anywhere on the board in order to try and maximize their points. And at that point, once all of the buildings have been placed, then you get to start counting up all of the victory points. So you're going to score your panoramas again, you're going to score island control again, and the center island here counts as an island as well. There's only four spaces on it. You're, you're going to count those coins. The chips that didn't fit into your board will earn you some points. And then the place where you're going to earn the most points probably is by counting up the buildings in each of the neighborhoods. 
So you start with the yellows, and then in this case, I've got this one yellow chip in here. So each building I've constructed on a yellow neighborhood is going to earn me three points. But that can go up to six, depending on how many I've built. You get to score your 10 points for your secret mission as well. So there are lots of ways to earn points, but it's very simple how you play this game. Everybody just bids, and then whoever is the winner gets to construct their building, and then you continue like that. The hard part here is calculating out the number of points that you're going to earn at the end of the game, so you've really got to plan out how you're going to place those bids and which buildings you want to hang on to. What skills, though, are you working on when you play Skyrise? Well, this is a game where planning ahead and budgeting your buildings is super important in order to get those points and I'll be honest with you I played this game probably a dozen times now because it's short enough we were able to do that and I, <laughs> I still haven't quite figured out what the best strategy is to win this game so it is strategic you do have to plan ahead you do have to budget these numbers on your buildings so that you know, eventually these tall buildings are, have the highest numbers and you're going to be guaranteed a win if you want it. Sometimes there will be an isolated neighborhood where if you place a small building, you're going to guarantee that you're going to win that space. So there are lots of things to think ahead about when you're playing the game. You've got your secret mission, so you want to put a certain number of buildings on a particular color of neighborhood. You've got the panoramas, so you want to make sure that you surround the lakes or the blimps or you know, there, there are lots of ways that you're going to be earning points and then you're thinking about which neighborhoods are you trying to build your buildings on so that you can get more prestige points at the end of the game. So there's a lot to think ahead about. There's so much budgeting and planning here that we are talking about executive functioning skills. The executive functions are those skills and behaviors that you need to work towards a goal. And there are multiple, almost competing goals, I would say, that you're working on. You want the chips to make your buildings worth more, but then you have to get the buildings on the right neighborhood. And then maybe you want to surround those lakes so you get those victory points too. So there, there there's really a lot of demand here for one executive functioning skill in particular, which is working memory. That whiteboard in your mind where you store information where you, so that you can manipulate it somehow. When you're multitasking, when you're juggling different kinds of information all at the same time, that involves working memory and there's a lot of juggling to do here. We also found that another skill that you're, you're, you're kind of practicing is quantitative reasoning reasoning about quantities math reasoning here is what we're talking about because you've really got to do some calculations in order to figure out how to maximize your points plus you're looking across at the other players whose numbers their buildings are face up beside their board so that everyone can see what numbers they have you're required to put them in numerical order so everybody knows what the available bids are going to be and and then you've got to do that math of well they have that building so they can beat me but do I want to play this high number? It, it is some, not complicated math, but there is some a, a lot of number crunching that you're doing when you play this game, but it's such fun number crunching, I would say. You're also exercising visual spatial skills. You're looking at these boards and trying to figure out which neighborhoods you want to win and how to create the pathway to get there through your bids. You might be trying to fake out or bluff another player and get them to play some of their higher number buildings in an area that you don't care about so that you've got a higher number that you can play on that spot that you want. You might be trying to win a bid on a particular turn so that you can take one of those isolated neighborhoods and be guaranteed to win. Be able to get rid of one of your low small buildings that have a low number on the bottom. It's a very very clever game in terms of that combination of abilities. You've also got some specific knowledge about these historical, these visionaries. There's a little mini biography of each of these characters on your player board, and these are people from history. There's a slightly longer biography in the rule book, and this is something that Roxley is so good at. I love that they do this. They put these real people in their games, and then they put a bit of information about who they were and what they did and why are they in this game what's what's the reason why they would be included so i really do like that you get a little bit of some specific knowledge about a few characters from history final thoughts though about skyrise well this is 
<laughs> this is a perfect game. Let's be honest. If if you do like those kinds of games where you're bidding and bluffing and trying to trap other players into playing th- resources that they'd rather keep, um, I, I don't think I need to have another bidding game in my collection because this is perfect. The the components are incredible. You can see the Sundrop building miniatures. The wonders are great looking. Everyone who has played this game with me has looked at these pieces and said, wow, this is, and they wanted to play again. You know, the, the weight of the pieces, they're tactile. They all do stand on their heads. So they're flat on the, on the top as well as the bottom so that you can stand them up and see the number on them, except for the wonders, of course. The wonders get to have these round domes or spikes on the top, but that's because they're always going to win. You don't need to know the number on these wonders. Uh, they're just beautiful. The art is is beautiful. They put, you know, for no reason other than it looks cool, you've got these gold foil cards uh, on the back, but the, even the artwork on the front is great. The, the iconography is perfect. You've got this 3D board, and again, why do you have these big pieces that accept that it looks cool? You've got this this sculpted map uh, of of the city, this floating city that you're building. The insert is incredible. Everything has a place, and everything has, in fact, on the side of the box, you've got instructions for how everything should be laid out, how to put it away, and on the bottom, you you can't see it, and I've used all, all four of the map pieces, or all five of the map pieces here when you count the center island. Uh, on the bottom of each of these pieces, they tell you what order they should be stacked in so that the box will close. Everything has a place, and it has not, and I've moved this box around here, there, and everywhere. Uh, nothing's really moved other than the fact that the buildings themselves kind of jiggle around a little bit in the box, but they're not going anywhere. The place where the buildings are has a cover on it, and, and there's a lip around the outside. Everything is going to stay in place. So great, great insert. Um, it's it's a game where you've got a very short rule book, and it's pretty easy to learn how to play. But the choices are very difficult it's always interesting what you're choosing to do. I have not yet figured out the strategy that's going to be the best strategy in this game. There's parts that are randomized. The way that you lay out the map at the beginning is randomized, so the neighborhoods are all going to be lined up differently each game. Uh, the These chips that you're trying to earn are randomized too. You've got the random ability from the deck for your wonder. So there's there's a lot to think about here. But it is easy to learn. You place a bid, the next player has to bid higher or pass. Simple. And then the first person to get rid of their buildings is going to trigger the next round, and then everybody gets rid of their buildings in the second round. So strategic choices, but a simple rule set. I love that. It's also got a short play time. I don't think in, in any of the game nights since I've gotten this that we've played it, that we only played it once. Uh, we always played it a couple of times because, well, I was usually playing with at least one new person who was sort of still learning the game. Uh, and as I said, my experience didn't make me better at it. <laughs> you know, I think in the last game, I came in second place by about five or six points. Um, but it's it's a game where it's strategic, but quick to learn, and the playtime is short. The components are beautiful. It's got an amazing table presence. Anybody who walks by when you're playing this game is going to be like, what are you doing? What is this? This is, you know, people are going to want to take pictures of it even. Um, You've got your victory point trackers are these little zeppelins in the deluxe version, and they stack together so that if there's two on the same space, they're stacked up on top of each other. They've got a little uh, hole in the bottom and a little nib on the top so that they can stay together. I didn't stack them up because I talk with my hands and I knew I was going to knock them over and it would make noise on the video. You've got the different numbers that each player is going to have, which adds something, I think, to the strategy and increases the replayability of the game. Um, you've, you've got that, that juggling of the, your secret goal of which neighborhoods you want to build on and the chips that are a different color from the neighborhood that, that they're on and which ones are you going to try to bid on, but you may not be able to get them. Plus, you've got that other goal of controlling the islands. There's a lot to juggle here, but it's it's so in, like you're involved in every turn, 
everyone's looking at the board at all times. You're always trying to think ahead. It is so much fun. I, I mean, I can't imagine how they could have improved on this game. That's not true. I can't imagine one way that maybe they could improve on this game. When, when we think about downsides, well, really, there are none. You've got this great table presence. But what, one thing I didn't mention, it's a great table presence, but it's not a table hog. The board isn't huge, and, and you've still got that 3D, uh, that 3D footprint. But you don't need a huge table to play this game. You, you need, you know, it's a normal size game board. Plus, you need spaces for your player boards around the outside. There's not resources and things like that that you're stacking up. There's only a few cards that are going to be at the top of the board. So it's it's even perfect in that way. Um, the only downside I can think of is that, well, I mean, there are only four secret missions. And so they're not going to be very secret for very long. It's going to be very obvious which neighborhoods the people are trying to get. Uh, and you know, there's only a few of those panorama cards in there as well. So... Um, the the only downside is that I want more, 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 more in this game. It's so, so much fun. Uh, and it's got just the right play length, I think, for the groups that I always play with. My, my son loves it. Uh, I think this one might beat out. He really likes Steampunk Rally and told me Steampunk Rally Fusion is his favorite game. That's also by Roxy Games. Uh, but, you know, every time we played this, he said, let's do that again. You know, his he had friends coming over. He's on. He was on a break in between semesters and his friends were coming over and he was like, let's play this. Dad, come and show us how to play Skyrise so that my friends can play it too. Um, what a fantastic game. What a fantastic experience. Uh, it's got an 8.1 rating on BGG, and the number one game on BGG has an 8.6. They're both by the same company. You know, has Roxley ever made a game that's not amazing? I, I can't think of it. Um, so once again, they've knocked this one out of the park. I love it. If you're a person who likes that kind of idea of bidding and maybe a little bit of bluffing and trying to lure people into playing the wrong thing, uh, you know, I, as I said, I can't imagine how they would improve the game except by giving me more, <laughs> more to do. The insert is perfect. The components are perfect. Uh, you know, I know that this is a limited edition that I've shown you today. Uh, so the retail version will, will be different. Uh, in fact, the buildings I think are more kind of flat featureless buildings instead of these fancy minis that I have here. But, um, it's just a lot of fun. So strong recommendation uh, from me for Skyrise. Uh, it's one that I'm looking at it now and I would, would love to play it again. <laughs> what my, my other son hasn't played it yet. So uh, I'm eager to, to try this one another time. So we had so much fun. Roxley, you've done it again. Um, if you have any questions, if you have any suggestions or comments, you can leave them, of course, in the comment section below the video, or you can email me at brian at brainsongames.ca. Brainsongames.ca is the website. That's where future episodes will go. Previous ones are up there already. Brains on Games is the X handle and the Facebook page and the Instagram feed, so we're all over the place. And if you enjoyed this video and you want to be notified of future ones, you can head on over to YouTube and click that subscribe button. Thanks for joining me, and hopefully I'll see you next time. Thank <laughs> you.